Hi guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan, a full-time trainer here with CBT Nuggets, and welcome back to another CBT Nuggets skill. In this CBT Nuggets skill, we are going to be exploring the topic of limiting access to Kubernetes GUIs, or graphical user interfaces. Now there's a lot of different graphical user interfaces that are available for Kubernetes. Many of them are open source, but some of them are closed source. And it's really important for you as an engineer right here in this diagram, this is you right somewhere over here, and you are going to need to know how to secure access to these graphical user interfaces that are running on your Kubernetes cluster. The reason that you need to understand how to secure these endpoints on your Kubernetes cluster is because malicious users can potentially gain access to these user interfaces and then use them to get information about your Kubernetes cluster, or even in a worst case scenario, they could actually use that information and exploit that information in order to gain access to either applications running on the cluster or access to managing the cluster itself. Once a malicious user has gained access to an application running on Kubernetes or the cluster itself, or even just one of the nodes on that cluster, the attacker can then kind of branch out from there and potentially exploit other exploitable endpoints within the cluster and gain more and more access to unauthorized data and access to your corporate network, which ultimately is just a bad situation overall. So what we want to do in this skill is explore what some of these graphical user interfaces are that you'll come across. I've actually built some separate training on some of these graphical user interfaces separately. Um, we'll talk about what some of those are, but we'll want to make sure that we understand some of the different mechanisms that are available inside of the Kubernetes platform, as well as at the network layer to secure access to these graphical user interfaces. Now, the reason that graphical user interfaces get installed in the first place is because it's not just you that's going to be consuming these Kubernetes clusters, right? We've got a cluster down here in this diagram, but we've also got other dev teams over here. So maybe we've got a finance dev team. Maybe we've got another dev team that's working on building some kind of widget tool. And there's lots of other dev teams that are potentially going to have at least some level of access to your cluster, if not administrative access to the entire cluster itself. Now, different teams are going to have different needs as far as the tools that they use to manage their applications that are running on these Kubernetes clusters that you're responsible for managing and securing. Some of the different applications that you might come across that are that have graphical user interfaces are things like the Longhorn project over here. And typically these applications will get installed into their own separate namespaces just for segmentation so that applications aren't kind of stepping on each other's toes. And so that's why in this diagram here, I've kind of showed these applications running in different namespaces. So right here, we've got a namespace for the Longhorn project. And Longhorn is actually a really cool project because it provides the ability to use node level storage rather than using a cloud native container storage interface or CSI driver in order to provision storage. The nice thing about Longhorn is that because it doesn't depend on cloud vendor APIs, you can actually use Longhorn with on-premises Kubernetes clusters. For example, if you're using K3S or KubeADM or some other local distribution of Kubernetes, you can use the Longhorn project to actually provision storage volumes directly on the worker nodes that are joined to your Kubernetes master nodes. Now, Longhorn itself actually exposes a management interface, a web user interface that you can access directly over the network. And if I recall correctly, by default, there is no authentication enabled for the Longhorn endpoint. So if somebody knows how to gain access to port forward to that web user interface that's running within the Kubernetes cluster, then that a malicious user would then basically be able to manage all of the storage that's being managed through the Longhorn project. And you can start to see why an, a malicious user having access to manage all the storage on your cluster can be a really bad thing. For example, if an attacker did have access to the Longhorn storage interface, they might be able to create backups of storage volumes 
and then offload those storage backups to a cloud, an external cloud vendor storage that they own and control. And then that attacker can basically take that backup of the storage volume and then restore it onto their own separate cluster that's running Longhorn. And then they would ultimately be able to consume any of the data that your organization has ended up storing on these Longhorn storage volumes. So that's a potential attack vector. And so it's really important for us to understand how to secure web user interfaces, such as the Longhorn web management user interface, so that an attacker can't manage storage using an unauthorized endpoint. Another example of a web user interface that you might come across to manage and kind of monitor and keep tabs on your Kubernetes cluster is this really nice project called Schooner. Now, I really like the Schooner project, and I've actually got the web page opened up right over here for Schooner already. They have a nice kind of landing page here that talks about it, but Schooner is basically an open source project. It's available on GitHub. It's not crazy popular, and it does have a lot of, um, you know, a little bit of buggy behavior, but it does add a lot of value because it actually exposes information about pods and services and storage volumes and all sorts of stuff, all the kind of core resources that you typically work with in Kubernetes. And it exposes that through a web user interface so that you can see that data very clearly and see kind of charts and graphs rather than having to use the kube control command line utility in order to utilize it. Now, if an attacker were to gain access to the Schooner web user interface, then they'll be able to get all sorts of information that kind of privileged level information about your Kubernetes cluster. And that would then allow them to attack certain endpoints more intelligently because they can actually see a list of pods. They can see a list of the container images that are being utilized. And if they were able to identify applications or pods that are using insecure older software, older container images that use outdated software and outdated dependencies, then they could potentially go after those application endpoints in order to uh, maliciously attack them and exploit them in order to gain access to those applications. So Schooner is yet another web user interface that while it provides a lot of value to Kubernetes administrators and engineers, it really does open up attackers to a lot of information that they probably shouldn't have. Another example of a user interface that you'll want to be familiar with um, that is, is called Chaos Mesh. Now I've actually built some separate training on Chaos Mesh recently that should be part of this training course. Uh, but Chaos Mesh is a really, really cool tool. It's very powerful. Um, it's very useful for engineers to kind of stress test their clusters and figure out some odd behaviors that might not typically occur in a production environment or I, should, I guess I should say a test environment because that odd behavior could actually occur in production when you've actually got real end users that are hammering your applications in many different ways. But uh, Chaos Mesh is basically a utility that allows you to run chaos experiments. You can stress test applications. You can randomly destroy pods, randomly destroy containers, inject uh, network latency, disk latency, and all sorts of advanced functionality like that. And so Chaos Mesh is a very, very powerful and useful tool. But again, it's powerful for the intended users, which are the authorized users of the Kubernetes cluster. If an attacker were to gain access to a Chaos Mesh instance running on your Kubernetes cluster, then they could wreak all sorts of havoc. You know, they could run CPU and memory stress tests and take down nodes in your cluster. And that could have a very severe impact on the other applications that are running on those worker nodes. So having access to Chaos Mesh, well, again, it's very useful for developers and engineers to understand how applications can behave under abnormal networking and you know stress circumstances. It is a very powerful attack vector that would allow an attacker to uh, perform basically a denial of service attack against your cluster by just wreaking havoc across your entire cluster. So Chaos Mesh is a really powerful tool, but it does expose a web management user interface. There is thankfully authorization that is required by default for that web user interface. But if an attacker had network level access to that web UI, 
they could potentially find ways to exploit that web UI and actually bypass the default authentication mechanism, which could allow them access to that application in an unauthorized manner. And so that's why we want to understand how we can secure these endpoints and make sure that unauthorized users do not have access to gain access to these different applications. So the idea here, right, is that you've got uh, a Kubernetes cluster, and you're, you've probably got more than one Kubernetes cluster in, in all honesty, right? Because if you have a Kubernetes cluster, you've probably got more than one that other development teams are using. Um, there's oftentimes not just an organization that's just going to have a single kind of monolithic Kubernetes cluster that everybody's going to deploy to uh, because it just helps to have some segmentation between different Kubernetes clusters for different teams that are running different types of workloads. And on top of that, you'll probably have separate Kubernetes Kubernetes clusters for you know dev QA test and, and uh, sorry dev QA and production environments as well. So you typically will have more than one Kubernetes cluster, but you should apply those same security principles to all of the Kubernetes clusters across your entire organization, not just uh, not just limited ones. So the idea here is that you've got a cluster right, and it's got some worker nodes right. And so these worker nodes are kind of reporting into this cluster and you've got pods that are getting scheduled onto these worker nodes right down here. And then the idea here is that if you're running a Kubernetes cluster on a cloud vendor, maybe like DigitalOcean or Linode or Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure, Google, Clu Google Kubernetes Engine, uh, GKE for short, um, those are going to be oftentimes exposed to uh, the external internet through IPv4 based load balancers or the actual worker nodes themselves right down here, they may actually have publicly routable IPv4 addresses on them. And so that opens up these nodes as well as potentially these applications that are exposed through load balancers open to the world. And so over here, we've got users that are coming out across the internet, potentially malicious actors, but also we've got legitimate end users that, that are hitting our applications as well. And so these malicious actors can come in directly across the internet and they can start to hammer the applications that are running on our Kubernetes cluster through the load balancers that are forwarding traffic to the actual application pods, but they'll potentially also be able to attack these worker nodes down here. So one potential security vector that you have available to you is to actually make these nodes private so that they don't have publicly routable IPv4 addresses and that the only authorized inbound traffic to your Kubernetes cluster is through a properly authorized load balancer or uh, ingress controller, which ultimately just uses a load balancer behind the scenes. But we're going to talk about a bunch of other security mechanisms as well. But this is kind of your basic setup here where you've got a Kubernetes cluster, you've got malicious users out there on the internet. Again, not all of them are malicious, but there are many malicious actors out there. And there's also a lot of automated scripts out there as well. So malicious actors will actually set up automated scripts that will go out and scan nodes on the internet. So it'll just kind of randomly find IP addresses out on the internet, like these worker nodes that we have down here, if they have publicly routable IPv4 addresses, and they will just go out there and look for endpoints, right? They'll actually perform port tests against the nodes on your cluster, and they'll try to find applications that are insecure. So it's really important for you to know how to secure your applications on your clusters so that these attackers and these automated scripts that they have set up are not able to exploit your environment. So in our next video, we'll actually take a look at one of the attack vectors that you can secure using different tools in your network environment and your Kubernetes cluster. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.